Hey, this is George. Hey, this is Frank. This is Real Talk with George and Frazier. What's going on, brother? How are you? Good, good day Saturday, man. Can't get no better than today. Relax, yeah. chilling. What's up with you? Oh, man, you know, same old honeydew stuff, man. My daughter had basketball games today. It's her first major uh, AAU type playing style as opposed to, um, you know, travel. So she was a little bit nervous because she thought she was just going to play one game today and that was it. And I was like, nah, you got you have two games today and two games tomorrow. She was like, four games. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. But, you know, heartbreakers, man, heartbreakers. They lost their first game by four points. And then the second game that they played at 10 o'clock today, they lost their game by one point. The score was 10 to nine. What? And they go up for the last basket, one of their uh, shooters, and boom, they miss it. You are like, oh, it's crazy. Oh, but, man. Those are worst losses. I would lose by 30, lose by one point. It just me. It is something like one point lost. Like, I give everything, coach. I give everything. Yeah, well, man. Like, you not know, they would have won. <laughs> well, not really. You know, look, it's just capitalizing on mistakes. You know, my daughter is playing up. She's a third grader playing with the fourth and fifth grade girls. So nice. That's already a improvement. Shoot, that's already a hype. Playing the big girls already, man. Hey, if you start off small, you go up, that's the best thing. I'm gonna always try that one time. Being a small yeah. guy going to the big guys, that's right. so intimidating. Even the practice is intimidating because you're like, you don't know what to do. You're nervous, you got you gotta show up all the time. You feel like you gotta be the best every single time. Right. It can be, be nerve-wracking. And stressful at some time, too, though. Right, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. So, listen, man, we got a good show. Uh, we were able to rebound off of uh, the last show. And this is uh, Kyle Norris came back with us, man, and, and had a great interview. I hope you guys Thank check you, that out. Check that I'm out. <laughs> um, we got another great show today. Mr. John Irie is his name? Irie, yeah. Irie. Okay, we'll <laughs> be here shortly, man. You know, it's interesting. You know, definitely want to check him out because uh, um, it definitely will be. it's going to be a good show. That's all yeah, I can say. It's going to be a good show. It could be, it could be one of them shows you be like, wow, man, it's going on. <laughs> yeah, man, I can dig it. Got a little comment here. Moses Field says, what's up, Frazier and George? Good to hear from you guys. Always what's good to hear from you, brother. What's up, fam? No doubt, no doubt, no doubt. Doing well. Oh, thank man. you, thank you, thank you. Oh, well, definitely should have performed. I had a chance to hear him actually perform in live in person. Man, man puts on a brilliant show, brother. He nice. puts on a show. All white, 80, old two eighties, all white. Oh, look at him, white. Right? <laughs> oh, man. Had ladies going crazy. Oh, man, that was a show. You should have been there, Joy. That was a show. You you love that show. It was a good show. Man, I was, you know, I was trying to make it. Oh, who know you was? So. Who know you was? We, hey, you got many more to go. So now we do. You know, we do things. You support family. Much Absolutely. Absolutely. So quick, Frazier, man, I sent you a clip offline uh, about Kirk Franklin's uh, issue. Did you have the opportunity to listen and see the interview that his, a little bit. his mother yeah. gave? Man. The part I listened to was, how you thinking, man? How you thinking? Well, you know, the, the reason why I sent that interview is because everybody has been dogging Kirk or dogging his son. And, okay, you know, the mother never really had the opportunity to um, give her side of the story. And her side of the story was almost um, as, how do I say this? Her side of the story was almost identical to what Kirk's side of the story was as far as what they yeah. had been dealing with. But what I like about that interview from the mother was, you know, it gave everybody context as to yep. what has been happening over the years. Um, I'm not, I don't want to say mental illness because I don't think uh, Kurt's son is mentally ill. I do think that stress, I do think that trauma, I do think that um, Envy, I do think some of the things that plague you as a kid will also plague you as an adult if you don't address it. That's true. You know, and for instance, what I'm not to cut you off, but just to finish right. my thought, you know, Kurt Franklin's family is a blended family. Exactly. When he met his present wife, she had a baby girl, and when she met Kurt, he had a son. You see what I mean? 
Exactly. So they had to come together and deal with that. And I know that it's hard sometimes because you feel like, oh, I'm living in two different houses. I'm being raised by teenage parents. Um, there's so many things going on. And maybe he loves them a little bit more than he loves me because he's living in their house. You see what I mean? Yeah. And this young man actually needs some help, some legitimate help. And he has to be able to receive it. You know, to hear the mother side of the story, um, this has been an ongoing battle and struggle that they've been going through. Apparently, I don't know phrase if you saw this in the interview, she even said that the son admitted to her that he got tapes on her. And I'm yeah. just like, what son records their mother, their own mother exactly. in an interview, I mean, in the phone conversation to try to trap them later. So exactly. it's just like, you know, there's this, you know, this spirit or this movement of manipulation and, and everything else that's happening, you know, that people really need to um, take in consideration when you cast judgment on somebody. Yeah. Because, yeah, he's 32 years old. And yes, a lot of times you have to sit down. He'll be 33. You have to sit down and let them make their mistakes as adult. But exactly. you also have to give them the ability to um, rectify their mistakes. Exactly. You know, we live in such a throwaway culture, man. Exactly. I was ever said, I mean, I think some of you don't understand too some of the struggles you have when you live in a family that actually in a spotlight. Kurt right. Franklin's in a spotlight. That's another trauma that most young kids don't talk about or don't see a need to talk about because, oh, you're famous. Your dad's famous. Your dad did. That's not me. I'm right. not famous. My dad's right. famous. You know, right. I mean, you got to deal with that manipulation. Also, people trying to use you only for your dad's fame. And yep. sometimes you get betrayed a lot. Now you did, now you start betraying your family because you feel like it's their fault. It's right. their fault. Kurt Franklin famous. It's Kurt fault because I had to deal with all this stuff because of your fame. I had to deal with all the burden that you dealing with, you know? And let him talk and sit down and talk like a man and talk look, dad, it's something you do that it affects on me. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how to deal with it. How do you deal with it daily? Right. You get a lot more than I do. How do you deal with it daily? I think that's one conversation he's probably to sit down and have with him also that he probably never sat down and actually had with him and say, look, son, this is how fame is. This is how a spotlight going to affect you. This is how people going to try to use you to get to me or manipulate you to try to get towards me or what I have or influence what I have on you. But that's a lot of things people don't understand to that kid also need counseling. I think a lot right. of people need counseling to show them how to deal with that type of lifestyle because your family, friends don't have that. They don't have to worry right. about their family being on Ebony Magazine or be on BET and every five minutes he's doing this or anything he does, he's on the spotlight. Right. And if, like who who said that thing happened with the pornography and stuff didn't affect his son, you know, in school. And your daddy a pedophile. Ooh, ooh, ooh. you know, and the guy was nagging him, and he had to get in a lot of fights. He and he got beat up a lot of times. He defended his dad. Now he thought go to resentment. You know, now I thought. Well, yeah, it's difficult. And the reason why I say it's difficult is because you're dealing with parents that were teenage parents. So all the things that we went through as teenagers, they went through it as teenagers, compounded by 100 because they had a child they had to take care of. Exactly. So all the mistakes that we got to make as kids um, without anybody seeing it, they were making those mistakes as teenagers and young adults with everybody seeing it and labeling them. And that's exactly. really the issue that we have. So I'm just saying that to say, you know, give everybody a chance and even though we here, Frazier and I, we have our opinions about what yep. could have happened, live in that situation to be able to make definitive or cast judgments or doubts on anybody. And I just wanted to be able to put that out there. That being said, let's yep. switch over and transition to our guest. He's getting ready with exactly. his camera right now. I don't know if he's ready to go or not. Uh, Mr. Jonathan Irie, welcome to Real Jonathan, Talk, brother. How are you doing? Hey there, everybody. Thanks so much for having me, George and Frazier. Yes, my name is Jonathan Avery, and it is a pleasure being on with you today. All right, Avery. Nice. See, I told you, Frazier, I always mess their names up. Mr. Avery, tell <laughs> the fans a little bit about you, man, and your bio. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, I can't blame you for the name. Uh, my last name is a bit of a funny one. Uh, it's a German W uh, or a Russian W, and so it's pronounced like a V. And Avery means Hebrew in Hebrew. 
So gotcha. I am, uh, I'm from the Washington DC area. I recently graduated from law school. I grew up in DC. I went to college uh, at Penn in the Philadelphia area. Mm -hmm. And I, I graduated from Harvard Law School last May. Wow. I'm planning to start work in law in the near future. But until then, I'm taking some time off to pursue a couple of projects. And one of those is music. I am a rap artist. I've been rapping for 15 years. I've been freestyling for, oh God, at this point, it's been like 12 years. Um, I am the three-time winner of the Supreme Bars Freestyle Competition in New York City. And I have at least two of the trophies to, uh, to nice, attest to it. Nice, nice, I have nice. two TEDx talks on freestyle rap and the psychology of improvisation. Uh, so I'd like to think that I'm interested in a whole bunch of stuff. Um, spanning far beyond music, but music is kind of a, a center point for a lot of it. So, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to be on here and just chat about everything under the sun. Nice, nice. Oh man, you, you gave us a list of stuff and you know I always have questions if you there want to. <laughs> so let's get to it. Why music? Why rap music? Why rap music? Well, you know, I wish the story were more interesting or dramatic, but the truth is it's pretty straightforward. When I was 10 years old, I woke up one day and realized I had like negative musical awareness. Um, I grew up listening to what my parents listened to, and they actually had pretty good taste in music. My, my mom uh, and my dad were um, both part of the counterculture movement in the 60s. Um, so my mom was kind of uh, uh, sort of associated with like the hippies, and my dad protested Vietnam. Uh, and so they listened to a lot of Bob Dylan, Creedence Clearwater Revival, the Rolling Stones, kind of a lot of older, like late folk, classic rock kind of stuff. Yeah, and like so, uh, you know, yes, yeah, so, yes. Yeah, so I felt like I grew up, in a, I felt like I grew up not knowing much about music. But the truth is, without realizing it, I actually already was steeped in in a in a sort of countercultural style of music, one that had revolutionary elements, that was uh, sharply, even harshly critical of society at times, and that appreciated the role of musicians and poets in being able to share their voice and their message with the general public. Uh, but I, none of this was, I was aware of none of this at the time. So around when I was 10, I was like, man, I got to figure out what my friends listen to. And I started listening to the local pop stations in the DC area. So for us, that was uh, Hot 99.5, in case you're familiar. Where are you guys? Where are you guys, by the way? Well, I'm Miami. Miami, cool. Oh yeah, I'm in New Jersey. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. So, so we're wrapping all up and down the East Coast. I like it. So, right. So in DC, the main like top 40 station is called 99.5. So I tuned in when I was a kid just to kind of figure out what the hell my peers were listening to. And they were playing a lot of hip hop back then. Uh, I mean, the pop stations were just starting to really get influenced by rap. This was, I mean, this was like around 2000, I would say 2002. So this was kind of after the gangster rap period had really swelled in mainstream yeah. in, in like pop music but it was entering what they called the golden age of hip hop. So it was a period like right after the gangster rap period, still heavily influenced by it with a huge emphasis on lyrical craftsmanship. So that's right. like, you know, Biggie, they played some Tupac, but I think there's a bit of East Coast loyalty there. Um, mm -hmm. Old Jay-Z, Ja Rule, some Nas, Lil' Kim, old Eminem, that whole era of hip hop. And I think that this is just such a special time in rap's history when there's such an emphasis on poetry and the technique. And I don't know, it, it awakened something in me. It struck a chord. I was into poetry as a kid, but you know, I was like 10. So what did I know about serious right, poetry? Right. But I heard it. And I think I, what I liked about it was that it took everything I loved about poetry, which was making music out of language and animated it. Like it made it live and percussive in a way that was more than just reading it off of a page in a classroom, right. you know? Like this is what, what the original poetry was supposed to be like. It was supposed to wake you up. And I don't know, I loved it. And I, I me being young and naive, I was like, I can do that. My friend's like, no, you can't. And I was like, yes, I can. And that was basically all it took. And, and so I set out at first to prove them wrong. And then after about a year of just kind of like writing, trying to get a handle on it, I realized that I actually really loved it. Like. Uh, uh, you know, after a while, I think I developed a bit of a voice for it. Uh, I would like to think I came into my own as an artist, although, of course, I'm still young and still starting out. And I remember actually my first battle um, back in ninth grade. I transferred to a new school mm -hmm. and somehow word got out that, like, you know, the short, skinny Jewish new kid is actually a rapper. And so they hauled me into a ring with the reigning school rapper and made us battle. And I and this is not written either. This is like a freestyle. And I had no idea what was going to happen. But to my surprise, I think the pressure uh, actually helped me to thrive because um, it kind of got to me. And instead of freaking out or caving under pressure, I actually just kind of felt the words emerge in my consciousness. 
And I knew, I said, I was amazed at how in control I felt. And I knew exactly what to say. And I don't want to make this sound more dramatic than it is, right? Because this is a bunch of like 14 year olds kind of messing around. But you know, when you remember being 14 at the, at that age, being in a battle feels even more intense than any battle you could be in as an adult, because that's your high school reputation on the line. Right. It's like the first year of high school, everyone's watching you. That's an especially sensitive age for, you know, for you to be subject to the opinions of your peers. And so I was kind of amazed with myself that it actually came out and I ended up winning this battle against this guy. And that made me think maybe I should do it more seriously. So I started getting into it. Um, I did shows in college. I won a couple of talent shows. Um, I did these, these TEDx talks and started battling more seriously. And I guess ever since it's just been something I love doing for fun. And then most recently I hopped on clubhouse uh, and started going around from room to room, freestyling for people, finding other musicians. And I think that's, that's where I came across you gentlemen. And right. here we are. Absolutely. So battle rapping. Battle yeah, rapping. interesting, right? <laughs> well, the reason why I'm saying that is because, you know, every kid wanted to rock. You know, yeah. I'm a huge fan of Rock Kim. Um, that's what I'd listened to when I came up. Yeah. Um, and a few other things. But battle rapping took a life on of its own, you know. And I remember back in the day, you either had to have jokes where you right. were pretty witty with jokes yeah. or you had to know how to freestyle a little bit. You know, yep. I couldn't do either with that. So, you know, I always had like a little book of small little rhymes, maybe four or five bars, just so they'll get off me because I'm really a fighter. You know what sure. I mean? But I don't rock like that. So <laughs> that being said, um, has, how has battle rap changed in the last 10 years? And is it more mainstream? So in other words, I know you said you're working on your music career, right? Are you writing your stuff down? Or are you going to go in and freestyle your entire album? Sure. <laughs> well, uh, that would be that would be pretty daring for me to try and freestyle an entire album. <laughs> but that would be a cool challenge. I think at the very least, I'd like to get more hype about that and get people like to know about it so that they'd at least know what it is and get the following for it first. Um, you know, it's interesting. You raise a lot of really interesting points, George, and this touches on a number of things that I've been thinking about lately. I should start by saying I had the pleasure of meeting Rakim while I was a student at Harvard. Because nice. He came. Yeah, I was the president of the music law group at Harvard. We were called the Harvard Recording Artist Project. Uh, and so we linked up with other groups on campus and in the Boston area, including the Berkeley College of Music, if you're familiar with them. And so we did a whole bunch of events related to music, music and law, music and culture, all that stuff. And uh, I think it was someone at the Divinity School, actually, who brought Rakim to address a crowd at like kind of a little community oriented church next to Harvard and Cornell West spoke there as well. Mm -hmm. So we were just kind of all hanging out, listening to each other. I was talking, I mean, I was listening to, to, to Cornell West and Rakim kind of riffing about hip hop and its lyrical history. And I got to meet him at the end and just, I, I you know, I didn't want to freestyle for him because I didn't want to be that guy, you know, but right. I, tell, I just, I, I told him that he was very inspiring to me. I loved his music. I mean, don't sweat the technique is obviously a classic. Um, when I be on the mic is one of my favorite um, raps of all time. And Primo's instrumental on that. I still right. love to rap over to this day. Right. Um, so I I get a sense that you and I are kindred spirits when it comes to at least certain aspects of yep. the lyrical tradition from that older style. Right. Which means that you know you and I both have we're all three of us probably have an interest yep. in how rap has changed. Um, exactly. So battle rap. I haven't done as much of it as I would like to. I certainly haven't gone pro with it. I mean, I when I was in college, I'd go into West Philly and battle people for fun. And, you know, I don't need to tell you that, that I stuck out like a sore thumb when I did that. But, uh, you know, once you show up a few times, as long as you're kind of mindful of the space, you're kind of respectful to everybody. Um, but, you know, you, you just kind of pop off and do your thing. Eventually, people respect you for it and they recognize right. you and, and, you, and they actually become like downright happy to see you, which is such an mm -hmm. awesome. That felt like an accomplishment to me, honestly. It was like right. some of these guys actually say I'd come to be like, oh, shit, what's up? And like they'd actually be happy I was there. Um, and that's kind of what part of what made me feel like I'd earned my stripes not because of just the music itself, but that I was able to subvert people's expectations in a positive way and right. show them that you can be unusual and you can stand out and do your own thing and help them to discover, to realize that there's something they enjoy that they didn't even know they would be open to. Um, battle rap, I think, speaking of which, has definitely departed from the original style that it evolved out of. Now, I don't want to you know, talk at length about this and pretend I'm some kind of expert on the modern yeah. professional battle rap circuit when I've never done like, you know, live battles on TV or anything or like scribble jam or anything like that. Um, but you know, when you watch the stuff that they do today, the guys who rap today are obviously quite talented, yeah. but I think that there are two differences. One is that 
there's they're usually a cappella. They usually don't have instrumentals. Compare that to like the vi- the famous video of Eminem in '97. I think it was Scribble Jam or the Rap Olympics. Yeah, he is just slaying it, right? But it's a different style. I mean, his flow is different. The style of his insults is different. And I think that it's because he had an instrumental behind him. Right. And having a backbeat provides, I think, just like, I mean, the backbeat is in a way a backbone for your ability to rap. Yeah. You don't need an instrumental to rap, but I think that it is pretty useful. And that when you take that part away, you are changing the structure of rap music. And again, I'm not passing judgment. I'm, I'm merely making an observation that you guys are willing to agree yeah. or disagree with. Um, that now it seems to me acapella rap is more popular in the battle circuit. And that to me actually seems more similar to spoken word. And the reason right. they like it is because you're not restrained by the need to co- to comport with a rhythm. There's right. more room to go off rhythm on yeah. purpose. And there are some underground rappers who um, who experiment with, with kind of weird rhythms. Like I know Aesop Rock, of whom I'm a huge fan, has yeah. like very rhythmically intricate rhymes. Sometimes they're a little bit deliberately off rhythm and it's sort of verbally experimental. And you've got Flying Lotus, right? Who's a beat maker who deliberately yeah. likes to sort of alter his rhythms and experiment with that. And so I right. think that this new acapella movement is actually very consistent with that more experimental style, which is interesting to me because it's mainstream, it's not underground. Yeah. Um, but because they're looking to experiment more and leave more open room for verbal emphasis, it is right. departing from that tight fusion of words with music yeah. that I right. think helped give birth to hip hop. I think if I may, and then I'll shut up about this, George, I think that this is indicative of a broader trend in hip hop to move away from hip hop itself and more toward rap as a distinct technique. Because when right. I think of hip hop, and maybe yeah. I don't wanna put words in your guys' mouth, but if you bring up Rakim, maybe you do too, we think of like the four elements. We yeah. think of like a cultural movement, one that in fact existed before I was born. So, right. right, it's a whole sort of like lifestyle or mentality. And rap is one technique that's a part of it. And now I think rap is kind of evolving into its own thing. And some people will be happy about that. Other people might be nostalgic for the old stuff. I think like everything, it's all trade-offs, you know? Yeah. There is a lot of verbal experimentation now in battle rap that you didn't have in the old days. Like some battle rap is pretty corny 30 years ago. Right. But I think that it's also not as fun um, in some ways. There is not as much of an emphasis on camaraderie, having fun with the beat, just being rhythmic, the dancing element. Um, it's kind of consolidating into its own form of verbal sparring. And the upside is that it's experimental and you're doing cool stuff. You see cool things with language, but right. you know, there is also that old thing. And maybe that's going to kind of get pushed into the background of history as time goes on. But I think that there was a more sincere love of music and the hip hop culture generally back then. And I don't know how to get it back or if it's worth getting back because change is inevitable. But right. I would say that's that, that the acapella versus instrumental um, and the emphasis on language instead of just kind of hip hop in general. Those are the big two changes to me. So, All right. Well, listen, Mark is, has a question. Hold on, Fresh. Okay. Mark has a question. Mark Leonard, he asks, does Jonathan watch URL battle rap? No, I actually, I, I cannot say that I do. Um, I don't spend enough time keeping up with battle rap. And it's something I would like to. So I'll definitely check it out. And if Mark or anybody else has any suggestions, you know, I won't pretend that I'm more of an expert on the subject than I am. I'm always looking to learn more. But to Mark's question, if I may, it looks like he's asking who my favorite battle rapper is. Yeah. So, um, I mean, bat, well, I mean, years and years ago, Juice was like really good. And there's a famous yeah. battle he did with Eminem. Um, yeah. In fact, Eminem lost against Juice. And then, of course, Eminem went to blow up. Um, Eminem, I think, is one of my favorites as well. I know that's a bit of a cliche. But like his 97 about God, it's nasty. He had this line where he said, so he said, um, I don't know if, if, I'm, if I'm allowed to quote someone cursing on here, but uh, this beat came on and Eminem went, I'm about to make this mic short circuit. This beat is whack as fuck. This shit fits you perfect. And he went, I got so many ways to diss you that I'm playful with you. I'll let the razor slit you until they have to staple stitch you. And everybody in this fucking place will miss you if you try to turn my facial tissue to a racial issue. And I was just like, oh, my God, that lyricism, the internal right. rhyme schemes. Yep. Right. So that, that's kind of what I'm talking about is that, that old stuff. I don't know if you hear it quite that way anymore because that wasn't just rhyming, but there was a rhythm there with a beat. Um, and I think that there was more of a need to improvise, too, because you have to keep yourself aligned with the drums. Right. Whereas now, yeah. because you don't have to worry about that, 
you could improvise more, but it's also easier to bring in pre-written stuff with any lyrical or rhythmic structure that you like, because there's no beat to hold you accountable to the flow of time. Right. That is true, though. And like, I'm gonna say, I'm going back when I first got to the battle rapper and they say, I was I was actually promoting the gentleman who managed the gentleman rapper I had, and one of the contests was if in the city of Miami had a big contest, five hundred rappers. Now he was asking for advice. Hey, how do I do battle rap? Uh, I don't know. I'll tell you what we do though. <laughs> what we gonna do though? We gonna practice this, practice your lyrics, and what you do is practice be able to diversify them, change them anytime you want to, interchange them, add stuff you want to add to it, and we practice that for like a week for this contest. And we went there, and the thing I let people learn about battle rapping is. You can't prepare for it. They just throw you in a ring. They don't they like, it. hey, here's a chance. Get five minutes. No, no, no. You can just boom, go. So we, when we got there, now you were two minutes later. You up. Huh? I ain't going to do anything. You up. And how that works was like, it was a continuation. So you barely had a break. You may have a five second break, two second break, whatever, but you barely had a lot of breaks. Mm -hmm. And you know what I'm saying? Is, he was so nervous. And I'm, mindset never tell me nervous. The lyrics don't come out the way you quite wanted to. They don't rhyme the way you want to rhyme. They don't, yeah. you don't, you can't sequence the way you really want to sequence it. Yeah. So now you go, boss, on your basic technique. You go skills, your inner skills of how to rhyme, rap, knowledge, word, all this, rhyology. It's how it's going to be said. Rhyology, rapology. So, and then, short of short, short, he came within three rappers of going national. Three. Huh. The only thing he stopped him was this point I put back. You said was that he went he used to being on tracks. Right. He was acapella, and it totally threw him off. Yeah, totally yeah. threw him off. So you want to say how important it is? I want to probably I say clarify how important it is the differential between styles between acapella and versus the person who's rapping on tracks and how mm -hmm. different it is from her to transition to that process. For sure. Yeah. It's well, let me different. add on to that question for Fresh too, because what we're seeing really quick is it's just an add on question for your analysis. What we're seeing is um, if you have a producer that creates your tracks uniquely, you know, you might be able to stick to it. But most people use backbeats that are already out there from artists that we already know. And that's what trips people up because those those tracks and those lyrics or a specific song already you know what i mean mm -hmm. so it flowed differently you're adding something to that they may not be part of that creative process to make that beat what it was so just to add on question do you think if the track is more unique for that artist they fare a little bit better or it's just the acapella just two different streams two different yeah. you know it's such an interesting question george and 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 and, and, and fraser makes a lot of really interesting points mm -hmm. based on the story of this guy who did the battles i think that you know, a lot of this is so personal, right? I mean, it, it differs on an individual basis. I think, unfortunately, so many of the most interesting and, and relevant questions about how artists work and think, in my experience, have unsatisfyingly general answers because mm -hmm. the actual answer is so particular to the individual that you're talking about. Um, so I certainly, I really do wonder with you, George, whether, uh, whether there's a big difference for other rappers between having an original beat custom made just for them mm -hmm. and rapping for a beat they already know. For me, it doesn't make much of a difference in my limited experience. I mean, I haven't recorded a ton of stuff and that's actually one of my New Year's resolutions. Um, I have had a few producers, you know, offer me some beats mm -hmm. and I've been writing to them. And I'm very careful about it because I don't, I don't want to like greedily jump on someone's beat or take it for myself yeah. without knowing that I can put a verse on it that's going to do it justice. Right. Um, but so, so maybe there's more pressure there in a way, if anything, um, where like I, I want to make sure that I'm doing justice to a beat that was made just for me because I want to be respectful to that per of that person's effort and time. Whereas for an instrumental that already exists with like a well-known song, you know, it wasn't made just for me. I'm not as worried. Um, so maybe actually come to think of it, I feel a little more pressure uh, for a custom made beat. But I think on the whole, it doesn't make too much of a difference for me. I think the best, one of the best things an artist can do in my experience is become so comfortable with what they do that those little differences in the terrain don't bother them too much. So, you know, as an example of that, Fraser, your friend, 
who yeah. got down to what was that, like one of the one of the, the final three, but he didn't make it through. Right. I mean, that's a really tough and understandable position to be in, right? Because you know, as we've been talking about mm-hmm. acapella versus having an instrumental, it's pretty different. And even right. I noticed the yeah. difference. That actually is a bigger difference for me, George, than whether the instrumentals by like a well-known artist or whether it was made for me by a producer. Um, like I have done battle raps before acapella. Um, they're not as natural for me. I can do them, but I always prefer to blend what I'm doing with an instrumental. Right. Um, I think I actually find it pretty fun to rap over well-known instrumentals. And if anything, it's a bit of an advantage um, because people like the nostalgia uh, yeah. the recognition of hearing yeah. someone that they know. So like, I was like when I did a show live in college, um, one of the beats that we wrapped over, I had a DJ on stage with me. That was actually a really cool set because I had live musicians kick off nice. the set, like a full <laughs> band. And I got right. like horns, I got people from like the like my university marching band and all that stuff. And then I had a they they hopped off stage and just like enjoyed the show. My I had a DJ hop on with me and he started like mixing instrumentals for the mid part of the show. And at the end we had the musicians get back on stage, we closed it out. I I turned on my guitar electric guitar and we did like a whole kind of live instrumentation thing where we kind of blended like some like a some rock and folk music with rap and it sounded better than than you might think um but midway through we one of the beats that my dj blended was juicy by biggie yeah and people went wild for it uh and so i think you know i think it's important not to piggyback too much off of other people's work um but that if it's like a well-known instrumental that is like dear to people's heart and you can do it justice like you will do well on it and actually yeah. like add a, a worthwhile tribute to it, then that can be a way to get extra mileage out of your performance. Because right. I think it's part of what creativity is, is taking things that are familiar to people and putting them together in unfamiliar ways. And so if, and that's what sampling is all about, right? I mean, a huge yeah. part of hip hop is sampling soul and sampling funk and recontextualizing it to create a new style. And so that is, I mean, I think hip hop is one of the most creative art forms there is for that reason. It's like, it's taking, it's making collages of good art to create new art. And so if I can take a beat that already exists um, and create a kind of collage of it for myself and show people that beat by like Biggie say in a new way, mm-hmm. then as far as I'm concerned, I'm doing my job. But that's only if you land it. I mean, art right. is part, I mean, exactly. rap is part art form, but also part sport. And there are exactly. tricks and stunts and there's technique and you got to land the stunts for it to work. Exactly. Absolutely. Is cool. that- I have a question. For, not music. Okay. I thought you had a couple of them. So we're going to get past that. We're going to transition yeah, yeah, yeah. this one real quick. Yeah. Law school. Why yeah. law school? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, you know, I, I ask myself that every day. Um, no, I, I decided law school. You know, it's, it is, it is a tough question. I mean, I'm still working this out for myself. I could give you a whole kind of, you know, 10 minute monologue about how I wanted to learn and I wanted to pursue professional opportunities and it's a path to changing the world, et cetera, et cetera. And that would be half there. That would be true. And I could also give you the short, the unfairly short version and say, I didn't know what to do with myself. And that would also be kind of true. I think that the answer <laughs> is somewhere in between, which is that after graduating, I, I was, I had been tired of being in an academic environment for four years straight. And I felt like I wanted to kind of rediscover myself a bit, get back in touch with other parts of myself and maybe get some like actual, like professional experience. So I took three years off and I did research in some other fields. So I was very lucky that this project came along and this professor asked me to help him with some work he was doing on public policy, specifically on drug reform. Mm -hmm. So he was interested in marijuana legalization and a variety of other projects that involve reform to American drug law and the criminal justice system. And I thought this is an amazing opportunity. I should take this up. While I was working on it with him, I realized two, three things. First, that I really did want to work on things that could help to make the world a more just, um, and if I could help it, more interesting place. Uh, and that law might be a pathway to do that because I realized that you know law is one of the structures through which all of our lives are affected and doing this work on like drug policy and criminal justice for like that made me realize just what a big role law plays in our lives and how far you can go having a law degree second um i realized that i was still really interested in things outside the law and outside of music specifically psychology Uh, i'd always been kind of interested in psychology 
And when I was in college, um, I had studied philosophy and history. And that had kept bringing me back to psychology because those, I mean, mainly philosophy did because we yeah. said a lot of important, difficult questions about the mind, how it works, the nature of language, the nature of thought. And you can't ask those questions in the 21st century without being interested in human thought and behavior. Uh, and in fact, it came up in the work we were doing. Some of the work I was doing with this professor who sadly um, succumbed to complications from a surgery a couple of years ago, um, a lot of that work touched on issues involving psychology because we were asking right. how can we use more scientific we how can we use psychological findings to make better informed policy surrounding drugs and crime and so that made me think i want to study psychology somehow and then third i realized well no matter what i'm going to have to get a degree another degree if i want to do anything right. of this sort so after a few years of that and after a few years of pursuing psychology research during that time off i decided i needed to go back into school I didn't want to do a PhD yet because especially these days, it's such a time commitment. Right. And as, yeah. as economists would say, it has a very high opportunity cost, you know, like you can do that, but it requires you to give up a lot of other options. So yeah. uh, if you're going to do a PhD, it had better be the place you want to be. And the truth right. was deep down, I realized after a good deal of soul searching that I wasn't ready yet for something like that. And this was tough because my grandfather was a PhD. He, right. uh, he was actually, he was, a, he was a, a Jew from Europe who fled the Nazis and came to the United States and became a professor in biblical archaeology. And so I always looked up to him and wanted to be a professor and wanted to do academia. Yeah. But academia, much like, weirdly like battle rap, is a, is a different landscape than it was all those years yeah. ago. And right. so I just wasn't sure. And I decided maybe the wiser, more practical route would be to start with a law degree. And I have, like, I have family who, who went to law school and who said it was worth it. And it, you know, it gave them a lot of opportunities. So I thought this would be wise. This would give me a degree. It's a way I can be back in a university setting, be around smart intellectual people and absorbing that culture. And maybe while I'm studying the law and pursuing some job options, I can just be around those people and radiate their curiosity and get, let their curiosity radiate to me. Exactly. And then I'll be able to see whether I want to do a PhD. So while I was there, you know, I was studying the law, um, but I really wanted to make sure to work in all my other interests. And it felt like they were seeking me out. And I know this is a long winded answer, so I apologize for that. But this Not is like kind of kind of indicative of the way that I think about all this, which is it was a long winding path for me because I was there for law, but I was really there to keep learning and growing as a thinker and as a person. So I did music while I was at Harvard and I met the students. I got involved in student activities. Um, I hung out with a lot of undergrads. I would go to their hip hop shows and sometimes get on stage and rap. I really just wanted to take in everything. So for me, Law was like a very practical and strategic focal point for figuring out what I wanted my life to be like and all the things that surround law. And while I was there, you know, I actually found a psychology professor who I'd always looked up to. And I met him and went to some of his talks. And very fortunately, he invited and graciously, he invited me to be a teaching assistant for his class. So I ended up teaching a course with him or under him. I was a TA, you know, so yeah. he's the professor, but I would hold like recitations for the students for like once a week mm -hmm. we they all come gather we talk about the material together we have discussions i grade their papers and all, all that stuff um and this is actually like one of the most meaningful things that i ever got to do and i ended up winning an award from harvard for teaching so right. i then went back and did it again and i'm doing it again now even though i've graduated with the same professor nice. so so i went to law school for this reason because i knew it would open doors even though I didn't know exactly what doors it was going to open. And now, you know, what I'm looking at most immediately is I'm supposed to start work at a law firm in the fall. Um, but we don't, you know, the future is always an open book. And exactly. I want to pursue music seriously. And if the opportunities presented themselves, and I know it's not just about luck, like you have to make your own luck. But, you know, if conditions worked out, I would seriously consider pursuing music full time. Um, but until then, I'm trying to kind of keep a stable path and keep doing what I did in law school, which is like focus on the straight and narrow, do what I'm supposed to do, but also just keep my feelers out for other opportunities that come my way, including for things that I wouldn't have thought of. Sure. All right. So let me ask you, why don't I got I got the question phrase? I know what the question is. Why don't you just become a music lawyer? Dang, I will say that one. See, no, do come on, Frage. I got you, Frage. That's why it's George and Fraser. I got you. I see that, man. I see it. <laughs> well, you know, um, that's, I mean, it's an interesting question. And yeah, I definitely thought of it. I get that a lot. 
Um, I think, <laughs> look, I, hey, never say never. And for anybody who's listening right now, who I might end up, you know, being face to face in an interview with sometimes, yeah. you know, don't think anything I say here too seriously. Um, <laughs> but I think the answer is that being a music lawyer or an entertainment lawyer sounds cool. And yeah. I'd definitely be open to it, just like I'd be open to a whole bunch of stuff. But I think that if I were to pursue music, I would want to really give my myself to it. I wouldn't want just to be helping other people with their music. I would almost be torturing myself because, look, I love helping people succeed and, and I love when people can lift each other up. Um, and I would be happy to do that for other people if I were in a position to be able to do so. But, you know, I have my own musical dreams as well. And I think it would be really painful to just be helping other artists do their thing and never right. actually be able to pursue it myself. So the way I say, like, right. if I'm going to do music, yeah. I want to do it all out and actually be an artist. And if I'm going right. to do law, there are other areas of law that are also pretty interesting, even if they don't have to do with music. Um, they also pay well. They're also mentally stimulating. They also, they might even give you more ways of doing good. Because the other answer, the other thing I forgot to mention, guys, is that, like, one reason I went to law school is also that, like, I did want to do good in the world. And I still do. Right. Um, right. One of the things that made me want to go to law school was that I worked for a criminal defense attorney in the state of Maryland, where I'm from. And we dealt with a police brutality case when I was in college. And I was amazed that this guy, like, allowed me to help him write the closing for, right. for our client. We saved a guy from getting deported. This was right. one of the best things that ever happened right. to me. And I saw the rage, I remember the rage I felt at seeing this, like how this guy just got mistreated by Maryland cops. And I thought like, I, you know, we all have to find a way to do something. And this was 10 years ago that this yeah. happened. Right. Right. And so so that wasn't necessarily the, the foremost reason I went to law school, but wanting to find a way to do good was a big part of it. And I think that there are other ways, like if I want to do law, there are other ways of more efficiently doing good in the world than just doing music law. So, right. so law is great. Music is great. Music law is also pretty good. Um, quite interesting and cool. I met a lot of inspiring people there. But I think that if I want to do law, then I want to ask myself, like, what type of law matters most to me, whether or not it has to do with music. And if I'm going to do music, I want to make sure that I can do my own music. Nice. Mark, nice. Mark says... Um, <laughs> You can keep your own 30%. <laughs> yeah. Definitely right. all good. So yeah. staying with law and issues, um, there's been a lot of different things that are happening from Black Lives Matter to Antifa. You know, we're seeing the rise of extremism in all forms and fashion. We're seeing um, the denigration of the American Asian population. It's now front and center. And it seems like we all always go through these little spurts where a different group of minorities get it. And what I mean by get it is, you know, until 9-11, it was mainly the black and brown community that were victims of, you know, law enforcement, misjustice, anything you want to call it. But after 9-11, it became the Arab community. And now we're seeing, you know, the Asian community and everybody else in between. As a young man, watching this, all this stuff and transpire and your bit, bits and pieces of experiences that you've had, how do you um, reconcile it first? And like you said, you want to do good in the world. What are some of the things that you can suggest to people that are good as far as activists, as far as, um, you know, civilians who are trying to get involved in activism? Because on my side of things, it's like, being a martial arts instructor, being a uh, martial artist myself, being a police defensive tactics training instructor, and, and so forth and so on. Every time I see somebody get arrested and I see the outcome of it, the majority of the time I say to myself, he didn't know certain procedures to limit that. You see what I mean? Yeah. Like for instance, cops a lot of times when they know that they're out of pocket, They'll yell, oh, he's grabbing my gun. And they stay silent. They never then yell back and say, no, I'm not grabbing your gun. My hands are here. You see what I mean? Because most of the time, a lot of this stuff is recorded, especially with body cams. So we only hear one side of the ver one side of the uh, equation when it comes to the police side of it or the videotape. We only hear one side. Second piece of that is if you're caught in a situation um, where you're being detained and the cop is like, Stop resisting. You know, a lot of people don't know to understand. No, I'm being completely compliant. You have to yell that I'm following every command you give me. I'm not resisting. You see what I mean? 
So we still only hear one piece of the conversation and it's just basic lack of knowledge. So I'm saying all that to say in a roundabout kind of way, um, you're doing good. What are you seeing most in your circle and do you think it's changing or do you think it's going left? Well, I think it's a difficult question and definitely one that we all need to be thinking about. Um, right. And I certainly wouldn't want to put myself in a position where I'm offering advice or a perspective on behalf of anybody else. Uh, I think that sometimes like the wisest thing someone can do is know when they don't have an answer to something. Um, I think, and of course, you know, you're really asking, I think, a whole cluster of important and thorny questions, um, all, many of which I'm still working out answers to for myself. Right. I think when it comes to the most concrete things, um, like specific things that people can do, things related to the law, well, you know, as someone who worked on cases when I was young or helped with cases involving police brutality, this is something that matters to me as, and it should matter to everybody. There are, you know, for anybody who's listening who's interested in this, there are websites that offer useful, tangible information about what to do in situations like this. Um, for example, there are hotlines. There's, there's a hotline associated with, the, with communities united against police brutality. So that is one thing that people can Google if they're interested in getting more information. Um, even the Justice Department has a civil rights hotline. Um, New York State has hotlines and sort of Q&A areas where you can get more useful information about what to do in situations like this. So there are resources available online and there can always be more. But just a reminder that, you know, there are there are authoritative places online to get data and instructions on how to better handle situations like these. As for what right. I see people doing, um, I see the conversation changing. I think, of course, as with any social movement, there are some people who resist change, um, not because they're evil, some of them, sure, but um, mostly because for a lot of people, change is uncomfortable and unintuitive. It feels unnatural to them to have to change the way they think about the world. Um, and that, that just makes it all the more important that you have a lot of people in visible places talking about it. Um, and not even necessarily pushing for one specific view or conclusion, but just having the conversation in public places where people can feel invited to participate in a societal dialogue about what a good society looks like and how we should be treating each other. I think that that's the most important part is getting people to feel that it's okay to be having conversations like these. And in fact, that it's important because other people's lives and dignity depend on it. Right. Um, I know on apps like Clubhouse, it's been quite impressive to see yep. people talking about it so openly. I was actually in, um, I was in an Ivy, it sounds pretentious, but you know, I'm, I'm, because I graduated from law school, I was invited to join uh, like a Harvard club on Clubhouse and they had a mixer for other Ivy League schools. And I was kind of rolling my eyes a bit. I was like, oh boy, this is, you know, Princeton, <laughs> Harvard, this is going to be a white privilege hullabaloo. But actually the topic that night was, um, was uh, anti-Asian discrimination. And it was pretty interesting and impressive to hear people talking so frankly and openly and constructively with each other. You're right. I think that this is a time of reckoning. Um, it's a time when a lot of people are realizing a lot of that many groups have been mistreated um, and 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 stepped on. Um, and of course, you know, this is a moment where unfortunately we're seeing with painful clarity um, not just how the black community, but also how the Asian American community has been treated. Um, and among other things, how the Jewish community has been treated. Yeah. We don't focus on this a lot, I think, but Jews are still the number one targeted group for hate crimes across the across the world, not just in the United States, but on a global basis. Jews are still the number one persecuted minority when it comes to reported hate crimes. Um, that's at least to the best of my knowledge as of when I last checked last year. Um, and so it is really important to me that we pay attention to the many, many ways in which different groups of people are uh, intentionally or unintentionally left out of our society and the conversations where power happens and is exchanged. Um, and we want to make sure that everybody's included in the opportunities that our society has to offer. So I think at the risk of offering a general answer, inviting people to be willing to talk about these issues more openly and even with painful honesty is, I think, the most important step. Because until we get that, no one's going to get anywhere with this. And as for music, you know, I think music has always played a really big role. I mean, as yeah. I mentioned, my parents' music was Bob Dylan, the Rolling right. Stones. Yep. Um, I mean, this, is, this was an, er an era that in its own way was at the forefront of social change, not necessarily in the form of legislation, not necessarily in the form of policy proposals, and not in the form, I mean, how do I put this? 
They were there. The consciousness. The demonstrations. Consciousness, exactly. exactly. They were there. They were a big part of the demonstrations, but it wasn't even about the demonstrations, right? It wasn't about the physical gatherings, which are often exactly. very important in their own way. It was just about the act of spreading awareness, getting exactly. people to think about these issues and see and put music to it, create a soundtrack to justice, you know? Exactly. Um, like, I mean, color, I mean, TV was a big part of it. Color TV didn't exist. Um, during, at the beginning of the civil rights movement, but being for for the American public to see people being beaten and kicked by police officers at sit-ins uh, and freedom rides, that was a yeah. big part of what raised the public's consciousness about segregation uh, and the need for integration. And music can do something similar because even if it doesn't show you visually, it can exactly. show you emotionally. It helps right. you to feel the pain of the people speaking. Exactly. And even if, you know, despite being, you know, I am a Jewish person. And so there are certainly certain aspects of, you know, feeling marginalized that I can relate to. But even for those that are not that direct a part of my life story, to be able to kind of contribute even indirectly to a cultural movement that brings awareness to other people's suffering and their humanity, that feels like a really special thing for me. So I right. think music, raising cultural awareness, and getting people to appreciate the importance of dialogue, even when it's uncomfortable, that yeah. is, those are probably, I think, the most foundational things that we can do. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. It does. You yeah. know, I like that young mind because when Fraser exactly. and I talk, we talk, you know, we're in our 40s, so we talk, quote unquote, we're old people, quote unquote. Exactly. But the younger minds, the younger influences, and things like that, it stimulates the mind in the conversation and it pushes it a little bit farther because there's some credibility there with the younger audience. I'm there with you. I'm going through this. I see yeah. what's happening. That yeah. being said, I have one more question about law and music. How do you think your future is going to work with this new social media climate and law firms running your background and finding out, oh, he's also <laughs> a rapper. Is that exactly. something that we want to <laughs> add into our law firm and will it comport to our social media policy. <laughs> ah, I got you. I got yeah, you. It's, <laughs> really, it's really interesting. Yeah, um, it is an important question. Um, you know, during the interviews, during the recruiting process, they didn't give me too hard a time about it. I think, mm -hmm. you know, most people actually were pretty impressed by it. There were, look, there were a couple of recruiters who kind of raised an eyebrow yeah. at, at the fact that I put rapping on my resume. And there, I don't think that what bothered them was even that I was a rapper, more that they that, that just the questionable decision to put it on my resume. But I was like, look, I'm here. I'm proud of it. This is, this exactly. is what I do. Um, and most of them were pretty enthusiastic. Like, they were amused. You know, they didn't always know what to do with it. And I didn't blame them for that. <laughs> but even, even the law firms, slowly but surely, are, are, are coming around to, to adopt modern cultural changes. And so, you know, one of the big movements, for example, in law firms is increased diversity, and among other things, having more women uh, sort of rise to the levels that they deserve to rise to. So one of the issues in, in the law world is that for too long, I mean, look, there used to be firms where they didn't even allow women to work, right? And there's yeah. still like way, way more men who are partners in law firms, which is kind of like the top position um, than, than there are women. And this is something that the, that this is kind of a big movement and, and point of reform in the legal community these days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that's commendable. And so I think that there is a movement generally, not just to be more diverse in the traditional ways, but just to be more open-minded and like pluralistic and flexible about the kinds of people who are interested in working at a law firm. And so I think like having someone who's a rapper, people are open to that. They're not, they're not yeah. phased by it. Now having, having, a, having a white guy who's a rapper who, or who purports to be a rapper, <laughs> that's a little trickier for them. But um, there have been once or twice in my in my recruiting interviews, they put me on the spot and asked me to freestyle. Uh, wow. and, you know, once I actually did it, because um, I was like, all right, you know what? Careful what you wish for. Right. And uh, I just decided <laughs> to, to kind of, you know, to to I was like, I see you, your challenge. And I raise you an actual freestyle. So and for the most part, people right. are cool with it. Um, yeah. the, the firm where I'm going to be working, I did a summer associate position in 2019 mm -hmm. and I wrapped at a, at a law firm event. And it went over pretty well. Uh, so people are cool about it. I think I think it's like everything in life where, you know, people will sometimes go in with whatever expectations they have. And sometimes those expectations are understandable. But if you can impress them uh, and show them that you actually are serious and that you're not bad at what you do, you can you you can not always, but usually overcome those expectations against you. 
And sure. I think that to my, I guess I've been lucky enough that that has worked out for me in the law firm so far. Now, as with other stuff, like, I don't know, the ways in which AI is going to change the law scene, that's a huge question. And I simply yeah. don't have the information to offer you a useful answer. Right. I will right. say, like, when it comes to law like lawyers or potential hires, like finding the fact that I'm a rapper, they've been cool about it so far. And to the, and it, to the extent that there have been a few cases where some recruiters were less than thrilled about it, I think that's actually a pretty useful litmus test. That's like a good self-selecting mechanism because, exactly. you know, people who aren't willing to be open-minded like that may not be the people where that you want to spend right. your career working exactly. for or working with. Right. So the people who have right. been open to it, that itself has been a good indicator to me that like, these are people where I might be able to build a community and find a meaningful career. Sure. Nice. Well, we wrap it up. We got it. No, we do now. I'm going to put you on a spot. We love right. doing that. We just love doing it. So. All right. So, Didn't see this one coming. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me, uh, if, how should we do this? You want a live demonstration of freestyle? Yes. But of course. Okay. Perfect. So in that case, okay. My other device seems to have run out of battery. So I think what we'll do, I'm going to use I've got a device next to me, another one that is working. So I'm going to load up an instrumental on here. I just worry that if you guys play a beat, that there might be some, some lag issues with the signal. So yeah, I'll play an instrumental on my side. Absolutely. How should we do this? In order to prove that this is live, I think okay. what we should do is I'll have you guys give me some words. And then I'm going to work those into a, to a, to like a 16 bar freestyle. And that's how you know it's actually off the dome. Okay. How does that sound? Sounds good oh, to me. Yeah. Well, I know mine is. George and Frazier. Of course. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> what are we throwing at? Um, Comport. Comport. Okay. Cool. Uh, what else? Come on, George. Give us some words. Come on, George. Come on, man. <laughs> uh, microwave. Topic. Microwave. And topics. Oh, sorry, mi microwave. And then what was that, Fraser? Topics. Toppings? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. And then uh, let's see. You want to give me like one or two more, and that should be good? Okay, uh, let's see what else we got. Let's see. Uh, okay. Hmm. In... Actuality. Actually, okay. Accountability. Actuality. What was that? Accountability. 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 Okay, cool. Perfect. Yeah, that should be a good list. We got, what is that? Comport, microwave. Did you say toppings? Toppings. Toppings, yes. Actuality. Accountability. Jordan Fraser. Yeah, give me like two more, and that should be perfect. Okay, well, what you got, George? What you got over there? Hmm. Okay, I got one martial arts and sports. Martial arts and sports, perfect. All right, yeah, that's a good list. That's a good list. All right, I'm gonna load this beat up. Let's get this going. You guys do the beat? Oh, yeah, I can hear you. Perfect, perfect. Now, let's see. First, I gotta go and spit it, so let me go retort that I'm killing all these beats with the words I comport. Yeah, I put them all in comportment and assortment. You know, I gotta start it because it's really so important, really quite significant. Plus, I gotta rhyme and say, I can get this music heated up just like a microwave. So, I gotta kill it with this wisdom I'll be dropping. They know I keep it sweet, loaded up with the toppings. And so, I gotta spit it, no fallacy. Because in reality, I gotta spit it with lyrical actuality, infectuality. I gotta spit it for any rapper who challenged me. Ain't another rapper. Who could battle me? So I gotta kill it with that lyrical facility. It's killing me. Yes, I got to bring accountability, responsibility into the rap theme. I'm about to start. And I'll be kicking it just like this shit was martial arts. I gotta kill it. I report. I retort. So I'll do this really live. It's an art and a sport. I gotta go and spit it while we're kicking it. Rhymes. Kicking these rhymes right here on Facebook Live. So I'm ripping and flipping and doing it because they know it's more for later. I'm doing this talk show live with George and Frazier. They know I gotta spit it. These rappers can't stand me. I do it DC. New Jersey to Miami. I gotta go and spit it because they know when I arrive. I gotta go and kill it and I'll simply do it live. They know when I provide all those lyrics so sublime and they can't stand up to my improvised rhymes. Yes, it's improvised. Like every single time I go and spit a lyric, leave the people hypnotized so they know I gotta spit. Ain't a rapper who could battle me. Now I'm done live. Yo, thanks a lot for having me. That's right. Come on. There you go. That's oh, it, buddy. 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 Yes, sir. <laughs> thank you so oh, much man. man thank you so much we greatly thank appreciate you. it thank you being here 
thank you for the topics. Thanks for your opinion, man. Thanks for your trueness to the game. You know what I mean? Definitely appreciate you. One more tip. Give us some tips to yeah. new artists or just some tips in general. Health yeah. tips, motivational tips. What are some of your tips you can give? Okay, three tips um, from the most practical to the most abstract. Uh, first, go. don't drink cold water before you go on stage. It closes up your vocal cords, makes it harder to speak. You're more likely to cough. It's just, it's just not a good look. You want to drink something warm. So warm water, tea, maybe some coffee. I actually usually, I've been teaching myself to cook during the pandemic. And so I've started just making home brewed ginger tea. Like I'll throw whole pieces of ginger into a pot, heat those up. Whenever I'm doing like a podcast appearance or rapping for people, I always, I, I really try to do that like an hour before just to kind of loosen my vocal cords. So that's like a very concrete, practical tip. Um, but it's easy to overlook. Uh, and they always serve cold water at like right. panels and stuff. Yeah. I don't know why. It's terrible. Uh, so yeah, warm liquids. That's the way you want to open up your throat and, and like relax your vocal cords. Second, more psychological. Remember that at the end of the day, people are nervous about public speaking, I think, because they're afraid of making mistakes. Mm -hmm. But it's not a matter of whether you're going to make mistakes. It's a matter of how you're going to work those mistakes in once you make them. Like right. even during the freestyle that I just did for you, it wasn't perfect. I had like little ideas flashing of how I wanted to structure my words, but I wasn't always able to hit. And so you work around them. I think the key to being really good at something is not about whether you never mess up, but how you take your mistakes and make them into something good. Cause then you know the craft so well that you can get from any one point to any other point. So go in with a more realistic mindset that you're going to mess up you're going to do something that isn't perfect. The goal isn't to be perfect in the sense of never making any mistakes. The goal is to be able to organize what you do end up doing into something that sounds good. Um, nice. And if you can help it, that looks effortless while doing it. So like, you're gonna, you're not gonna hit everything you want. Something's not gonna go right. The question is what you do with it. You know, it's kind of like the saying, like, um, I mean, there are all sorts of versions of this quote, like, it's not whether you get knocked down, but whether you pick yourself up, or it's not about what cards you're dealt, but how you play your hand that same principle, like, like something's going to go wrong and it's going to come from you. So be realistic about it. Be just be grounded and prepared for it and just be ready to adapt when it happens. And the third thing I think is that another reason people get nervous on stage and have trouble doing their thing is because at the end of the day, as simple as it is, people are afraid to be themselves. Correct. Like, you know, I really like I stand out, right? I'm, I'm a very conspicuous type of musician. I mean, both because I'm a white guy who raps and because, I mean, and a Jewish guy who raps at that, and because like rapping is already a fairly ostentatious art form. And so you got to be proud to be you. And it's, it's normal to doubt yourself, but you can't give into those feelings of doubt. Yeah. Like, why, like people worry, oh, like, what if they think I'm, I'm abnormal? Like, who wants to be normal? Like, right. everybody who's good exactly. was, was breaking from a pattern from, where they were asked to comport with something else in their own time, and they broke that status quo to be their own thing. And yeah, you know, weird alone is not good. You have to be good too, but weird is a necessary ingredient. You have right. to be willing to stand out and break rules because that's what musicians do best. We break rules in ways that people find beautiful and that make more sense than the rules themselves. So you have to be comfortable and proud enough of what you do that you're willing to break those rules sincerely rather than being nervous about it. So drink right. warm liquids before a show, be prepared to make mistakes and adapt to them rather than avoiding them. Don't be afraid to break rules because that's when you really shine. Sure. Absolutely. So, now tell everybody they can find you on all social media platforms and they want to follow you after this. <laughs> yes, thank you, great. So you can find me on Facebook, it's just my name, Jonathan, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N. My last name again is I-W-R-Y. And my Instagram where I'm spending a lot more time these days is Mr. Underscore Every. So that's M I S T E R underscore I W R Y. Again, that's M I S T E R underscore I W R Y. And on Clubhouse, if you search my name, Jonathan Every, you can find me on there as well. And uh, yeah, I'd love for anybody to get in touch, tap in. I, I follow people back. I'm sometimes a little slow to respond to Instagram, not because I'm some kind of influence or anything, far from it, just because like I was so inactive on social media before, I've been getting more traffic on there now. And I'm just kind of adapting to actually like being this, this active on it. So I always respond to people. Sometimes I just take a few days, but I'd love to hear from anybody who's listening in advice, feedback, snide remarks, words that I should rhyme.
pretty much whatever. I'm just looking to meet people and keep learning and grow. And it starts here. And I'm so thankful that you guys had me on the stage with two of you. So, oh man, so we're well, thankful to have you, brother. We it's definitely family, appreciate buddy. you. All right, it's the family. You're Come back out. anytime. It's definitely family. waiting to hear this new album that you're getting ready to drop. You know what I mean? That's right. Keep Thank us you. posted. Thank, Thank you, you so me, much. Brother. For sure. Thanks a lot, you guys. Take care, George. Take care, Frazier. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you, brother. You. Man. There you go. Told you. Another banger, no, man. Another banger. We just keep knocking them out the park. We got a George Frazier song. <laughs> Too funny. No doubt about it. Listen, <laughs> folks, that was our show. We definitely appreciate Jonathan for coming on, man. Sending some time and talking, you know, real life stuff, wisdom, exactly. sharing his art and his talent with us. You know what I mean? It's very rare to come on a show like this and just flow and just rock the way you want to and be accepted for that, man. So we definitely appreciate him doing exactly. that. We definitely appreciate him standing in and appreciating the culture and raising it up. You know what I mean? So that's exactly. our show. Definitely I'll our show. One more point for you, though, Joe. I want one more point. They also a different aspect of the hip hop community in a different way. Everything always have to be. The norm, right. think outside the box. Don't That's be right. afraid to immigrate and be creative and step out. Be yourself, like you said. Be exactly. yourself. If you're gonna be a rapper, be a rapper. Don't be influenced by other people. Find your own style. Find your own love for the for the art and create yourself. That's right. Mm -hmm. Find your lane. Find hey, this is George. Hey, this is Frags. And that was real talk with George and Frazier. Y'all have a good weekend. Peace. Have a good weekend. Peace.